Welcome to the guest show on Radio Kuwait. This show features women and men who have made a difference to Kuwait with their work and their life journeys. The show is scripted and presented by Chitali B. Roy and directed by Anis Bakar. show on Kuwait Radio. Well, Kuwait Radio is honored to present Dr. Adarsh Swaika, Ambassador of India to Kuwait. Dr. Swaika is a career diplomat who joined the Foreign Service in 2002. He has a PhD in chemistry from Delhi University. And we bet a lot of diplomats cannot claim that. His overseas postings include, um, he's, post, he's been posted in Russia, Bulgaria, China and Bangladesh. Now, before his posting in Kuwait, he has been working with the Ministry of External Affairs in Delhi in various capacities. But before he came here to Kuwait, he was Joint Secretary Eurasia, responsible for bilateral relations with Russia, Ukraine, Central Asia and the Caucasian region. Now, Kuwait, interestingly, is uh, Ambassador Swaika's first post in the Middle East. Not only is he looking forward to learning more about the complexities of this region, but uh, quite understandably, he's eager to strengthen and improve bilateral ties and mutual cooperation between Kuwait and what is its traditional ally, which is um, which is India. So, uh, and because of this, he, since he has come, and which has not been very long, I think uh, he's been here since December, um, last year and so he has been involved in constant and proactive dialogue between various uh, stakeholders and um, not only does he want to strengthen the bridges that have already been built over um, over decades but he's also eager to see the gaps and to build new bridges of understanding so I'm uh, really looking forward to this conversation Welcome to the guest show. We are honored today to have with us Dr. Adarsh Swaika, Ambassador of India. Dr. Swaika is new to Kuwait, but in a very short time, uh, he has kind of um, made himself, uh, endeared himself to the community here and to other people of the diplomatic circle. So we just want to find out a little about Dr. Swaika and what his experience has been like here in Kuwait and as a diplomat. And I've given, Dr. Swaik, I've given a short introduction to you, uh, informing people about, you know, about your education and where you have been posted. But we'll be very happy if you can tell us a little more. Firstly, thank you for agreeing to be here on the guest show with us. Thank you for your time. I know you're very busy. Uh, first of all, thank you, Chaitali, for having me on your very popular show. And uh, to all the listeners, my greetings to all the listeners uh, who are today joining us on this show. Uh, from my perspective, I hail from West Bengal, uh, a small town called Asansol, which actually is an industrial town. And my early school days were in Asansol, but I quickly shifted uh, to Ranchi, where I had my education in a boarding school called Vikas Vidyale, though it names Vikas Vidyale, but it's actually an English medium school. Okay. Uh, then I went to Delhi and I had my, uh, I did my BSc honors in chemistry and then MSc and PhD. So that is how I think. Uh, That's how it has unfolded. Yeah. Now, so I want to ask you, Dr. Swiker, about, you know, your. It's a very interesting journey that you were doing your PhD in chemistry, perhaps thinking of going into academia, and then uh, you chose the foreign service. Now. What is the reason for why did you choose diplomacy as a career? Did it kind of happen to you? Was it planned? Was there a proceed? You know, was there anybody in the family who had done it before you? Uh, yes, or yes and no, both. Uh, I didn't have a plan to go to mm -hmm. foreign service per se, but uh, I was clear that I want to go for civil services. 
Okay. And that also not because of any family leanings, but because of my peer group. We all from the school were together in the college and university. So I saw many of my seniors preparing for the civil services. So that actually drew me towards uh, uh, towards uh, civil services. And one very interesting fact is I took law as one of the optionals. And probably I was the only candidate in Delhi University who, without doing law, was doing law. Oh, really? Taking law. And is that possible? Uh, it's possible to do that. It's You've possible it. to do that. Uh, but then uh, law is a subject which is very technical in nature. And, okay. and I can tell you this now, I think it, uh, it's history, but I used to attend f classes in law faculty because those who were uh, actually uh, law faculty students, they were uh, going around. So just <laughs> to having a good time. <laughs> just to get a sense of what yeah. actually the law professor, you, know, you can read the books, you can understand yeah. on your own. But actually, I did some classes and nobody could point out mm -hmm. he's not a student of our college. So I used to sit in some of the classes to understand what actually case studies and all that. It helps, uh, you know. So uh, that is how. And one of my seniors, uh, who is also now into the civil services, he actually took pains. He was three years senior to me in the school mm -hmm. and because of whom I came to Delhi. So he mentored me and he actually, uh, he was doing his exams and he taught me law. Mm -hmm. to a certain extent. But so then was, when is it that you decided that you don't want to do law? And, uh, and Somewhere somewhere when I was doing my graduation, I, it became clear that I that's wanted to... That's not meant to, for you. Uh, I won't say that, but... I mean, you, I, don't I, want, you didn't yeah, want to do yeah, it. You yeah, didn't I, want to pursue I, it. That, this was a stepping stone yeah. for me to civil services. And chemistry is a good option. It's a scoring optional. So I thought I will continue with that. But, you know, civil services is a very uncertain kind of that's uh, right. exam. That's right. And it is not only that you have to be good in your subject. There are a lot of other factors. And with a number of disciplines, uh, you don't know which discipline is going up, which is going down, which will fetch you marks. So it is kind of a gamble. So, And then I had this option of chemistry. So I continued doing that. My PhD supervisor was kind enough to give me that flexibility that, yes, you can do your exam preparation for three months and then continue with the PhD. So uh, it happened. And in fact... When I qualified, uh, I had not complete. I did my practical part of my PhD, but I not completed my theoretical part. Okay. So when I was going for my first posting to Moscow, yeah, I had left in one year doing the training and all. I had left. I thought I will not be able. So the day I was flying, I submitted my thesis on that day, and I came back after three months from Moscow to give my viva. The and viva. Then, uh, so I think that's happened. great. The fact that you did not leave it, you com you know, you completed it. Well, in and fact, I left in between. So, yeah. but somehow I think I, you some, managed some it. Some people pushed me. Though you have reached so far, yeah, so you why should. not just? Yeah. But I remember. One of the things that you told me when we first met is that you are interested, uh, very much interested in increasing the the commercial ties between India and Kuwait, you know, and that I said, yes, I can understand where from where that's coming from. <laughs> so, Dr. Zwaika, I wanted to ask you, uh, when is it when you joined, uh, when when you became a diplomat, where was your first posting? Where did you go? Uh, my first posting was to Moscow. Uh, okay. Generally in foreign service, uh, when you join the service after the basic training of, uh, in our time, it was uh, one year or two, uh, two years. Okay. And uh, after you do your initial training at headquarters, you have to learn a foreign language. And I chose Russian. So I went to Moscow. We did a Russian language for one year in, in People Friendship University in Moscow. Then we shifted to Moscow State University. And uh, once you complete the exam and you pass the exam, you're confirmed in the service. Till then, you are not confirmed in the service. So after confirmation, then I, uh, since I had done two years in Moscow, I opted for uh, another station and I was given uh, Sofia, Bulgaria. Yeah, so, I, I noticed that you, you were uh, posted in Moscow, Sofia and China, three countries in which com communism played a very, very strong role. Um, all three countries have ideological similarities. So how... Similar or different were these experiences? Uh, first of all, to be very clear, there is no, there was no method in the ministry posting yeah. me to three communist countries. It so happened. It, it generally happened. happens because mm -hmm. the vacancies and who is applying for it and all. So it was like that. In fact, from Sofia, I wanted to go back back to Delhi because generally you do one or two and postings you go and home. you go back. But then I was asked on the last day whether you would like to go to China. So who will refuse China at that mm. point of time mm. when our relations with China were actually uh, going very strong, particularly from the economic point of view. So I went to China. 
on the similarities yes there was some similarity but not because there were differences uh, russia is traditionally very very strong partnership with india both at the people to people level and every sector uh, you can think of uh, very lot of warmth uh, at people to people level bulgaria many people may not know but again a very very friendly country a uh, lot of a uh, lot of uh, warmth for indian people there is uh, indology department there there is a friendship indo bulgarian friendship group there is uh, indira gandhi school there so uh, in a way it was also a very uh, nice posting a very very naturally very beautiful the vitosha mountains were just half an hour 45 minutes drive from the city and then china yes in its own way is a very big country it was our trade and relationship was growing at that time so i think uh, all three countries were different in their own way uh, but yes uh, the sentiments that particularly the market thing if you go to a market in russia or china they were not that forthcoming at that point of view. so you can see you could see that point of view, but i think things must have changed things really. must have changed so you and then you had the the high, you were the high commissioner in bangladesh for 3 uh, years that must have been a totally different experience closer to home uh not the high commissioner but deputy high commissioner deputy high commissioner yeah, but uh, it was actually a very very different experience uh, from what my earlier three postings were okay yeah uh, when i say this i say this because bangladesh is a country with which we share so much there are so much of uh, issues there's so much of positive things happening the country is surrounded uh, by india on all the four sides and actually uh, i don't know whether you are aware of not that we share the largest boundary with bangladesh not with any other country oh no i don't the know largest okay. land boundary is with bangladesh so uh, in a place like bangladesh uh, whatever you do generally in foreign service you don't see practical implementation of many things you do but in countries neighboring countries like bangladesh you actually see what you do translates into very very practical uh, practical things for example if i can tell you of connectivity uh, uh, we have road connectivity we have rail connectivity we have sea connectivity air connectivity and during our time also we increase connectivity there were bus routes added there was this whole the cruise thing which you would have seen now yeah, we now were working on happening. that India agreement was signed yes yeah, so that agreement was signed during that so all of these had practical implementation and you, you know dhaka traffic was such that if you go to for one meeting it took you sometimes 1 hour 2 hour so we used to have four four meetings in a day we go in the morning and come back in the afternoon okay. so that was the nature of work okay. but i uh, but to be very frank i think that was really a very very good posting from work point of view yeah and the, the dhaka traffic sounds like the delhi traffic <laughs> yeah, i would say i think delhi is much Even better. much <laughs> uh, better uh, okay. dhaka has its own. it's not that the roads yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. were not narrow roads were but there's so but much of population uh, pressure of population. and big cars and all that that uh, okay. it sometimes for I 10 see. kilometers you might need one and a half hours wow yeah. yeah that's quite a long time so the middle east is a new region for you and uh, so what have the initial months been like uh it's a new region for me both because i haven't served in any country uh, middle east country or even at headquarters handling this desk uh but what i know is that this is a region of enormous strategic importance for india it is our extended neighborhood and uh, i feel that i'm lucky to be part to actually know this region i have so far worked in asia almost uh even in delhi when i was there before this i was dealing with russia ukraine central asia and all so it's a new region for me i am really looking forward to to it my initial months uh, i think uh, have been quite good uh, in terms of that i have been able to meet a lot of interlocutors both from my kuwaiti uh, friends as well as uh, the indian large indian community i have been able to meet in the before my credentials it took 3 months but i think that gave me the opportunity to meet a lot of our uh, indian brothers and sisters we had met over 300 associations uh, and now after the credentials i have been able to call on the dignitaries in kuwait various stakeholders because ultimately if you need to put forward your idea you need to meet and you need to discuss yeah and you've been very active as one can see you know from the press reports which come out that you are meeting 
almost every day you're having meetings with, the, as you said, different stakeholders. Now, Kuwait has many centuries of right. relationship with India. Um, how do you perceive has this uh, relation changed or at, at, at the point where we are standing, how do you see it now? Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, Kuwait and India share very, very historical relations, as you just mentioned. Uh, in the 18th, 19th century, even early 20th century till 1950s, I think there was a very, very strong uh, trade component, uh, very strong people-to-people -people connect. Uh, a lot of trading was happening between Kuwait and India. They used to come with uh, pearls, uh, Arabian horses, dates and all, and they used to take many items like wood uh, and uh, textiles and other things from uh, uh, India to Kuwait. So that active maritime contact, that people-to-people -people contact, uh, has remained in, in, in the sentiments. Whenever I meet any Kuwaiti, they deeply and fondly remember the India connection. But what I feel has changed in the last few decades is that Kuwait also, after uh, 1950, started looking towards other markets, towards the West, towards Japan, uh, and other countries, East Asian countries. Uh, we also had a lot of structural transformation, mm -hmm. both internally, yeah. externally. Mm -hmm. So I think Somewhere, I think there has been a stagnation, mm -hmm. but uh, my effort, therefore, is that we need to connect the youth of the two countries. Youth are our future, and we need to connect them. So that has been one change. I feel that there is not that same sentiment which the youth share, which the people of older generation may share with each other. Yeah, that's yes, absolutely. So India, uh, Kuwait has a I think the largest population of expatriates and you're dealing with very, very complex issues. What would you say is, uh, you know, some of the most uh, challenging issues here facing uh, the community? We do have, as you rightly said, we do have a very large population. In fact, it is uh, the Indians constitute the largest expatriate community in Kuwait, almost 1 million, 22% of the population. So when you have such a large sample, there are bound to be some issues uh, here and there. But what I can tell you from my meetings with various stakeholders, uh, when I call on various dignitaries, even today when I called on uh, the governor of Jahara, he was so explicit about uh, the Indian community. Uh, they mentioned that Indians are so trustworthy, the first, and hardworking. And that I feel, and that they are contributing to the Kuwaiti society. So these are the sentiments shared across the board. But yes, as I said, if you have such a large population, there will be some issues here and there. And uh, we are uh, taking up with the concerned authorities. There are issues relating to family visas, which are common not to yeah, India, but common, common yeah. to all. Uh, there are issues relating to accreditation of professionals. So I think all these issues uh, I am taking up uh, with all the concerned uh, Kuwaiti stakeholders. And we hope that we will be able to make progress. On that. Uh, during COVID, there was a very strong uh, time. That was a very difficult time when Kuwait and India uh, collaborated and cooperated on many fronts. I think uh, the on, on the on the health sector, uh, Kuwait, India sent a medical team to Kuwait in uh, 2021, and then Kuwait received 200,000 doses of Oxford vaccine. How is the issue of collaboration on the medical front progressing? Did it kind of end there, or is it an ongoing process? I won't say it ended there, but it was uh, one phase of very very active collaboration. And actually, I would say in modern times, this was one uh, such uh, incident where actually both countries demonstrated the friendship and solidarity, uh, which is reminiscent of our close partnership. But this is one area which, again, has a lot of potential. We are working very hard on this. For example, medical treatment in India today, I think India offers uh, world-class medical treatment at affordable prices. So many Kuwaitis travel to a lot of countries at government cost, but this is what I think uh, they should explore, that a country which is not very far, which you share a lot of uh, habits, cultural affinity, food, tourism. So people, are people Kuwaitis are exposed to India so much. And if this country offers so much of facilities and uh, it's a cost-effective option, I think uh, that one should exercise. Similarly, I think... Recently, uh, you would have heard that we had this investment conference mm -hmm. uh, in early uh, early May, 
and uh, we had a delegation from uh, the Confederation of Indian Industries, which also had a component of Apollo Hospital representative. And he also met a number of uh, hospital owners, private hospitals, government hospitals. And uh, the feedback was that there was a lot of interest uh, in Kuwait on tie-up between the hospitals or setting up of chains by a premier hospitals. That is another area. Uh, similarly, uh, Indian pharmaceutical products. Yeah. Today, they are very, very few uh, available in the Kuwait market. They Again, are. They are available. They are, but very few. Few. Again, uh, many uh, of the Indian medicines, generic medicines, are uh, being exported to US and Europe. So if that can happen, why not to Kuwait? So that is another area where we are working, uh, along with the Ministry of Health here, to see whether the Indian medicines could be made available to people in Kuwait at uh, such affordable prices. I've, I've personally known uh, a few Kuwaitis. Uh, there is one friend of mine who is from the Al-Sabah family, mm. and you may have met her. And she went for her treatment uh, to Delhi. Mm. For uh, she, treated, she got her mother's eye treatment mm. done in Delhi. It was a surgery, and mm. she was so happy with it. And she says that uh, that if I have any any health issues, I know mm. the place to turn to. Mm. Yeah. So if we can highlight, you know, yes. people like this who who are actually the real life experiences, you know, who have had good experience, then it that I think that will help um, help both sides. So um, you you have been, as I mentioned before, you've been very active. And you've reached out to different stakeholders. And um, as you said, in both sides, you know, uh, Indians and Kuwaitis, how productive has it been with the, you know, and proactive has it been with the local, with the Kuwaitis? What what has your experience been like? Uh, the uh, When I have taken issues with our Kuwaiti uh, friends, I yeah. think they have been receptive. Yeah. Now, I think it takes time in any system to, yeah. to react to it, to uh, to give answers. So we are working with them closely. Uh, but yes, uh, they have been very receptive to the idea. And that is why I think we are also having repeat meetings with okay. them because to follow up on what we discussed for implementation. Mm -hmm. So I, I am quite confident that some of the ideas we have put on the table, they will eventually fructify. And we need to work on it because uh, new ideas will need to be, they will need to see from their own perspective how much it suits them. That's so. right. That's right. So I think, uh, Anis, we have to take a break now. So we'll take a break, Excellency, and come back here. Welcome back after the break. We are speaking to Dr. Adarsh Swaika, Ambassador of India, having a very, very interesting conversation. Um, and Dr. Swaika, cultural uh, diplomacy is leads to greater people to people engagement and in some ways i suppose cultural diplomacy at times is even more successful than other forms of diplomacy let's say so this year you all organized uh, the festival of india how how successful was that how how did that go uh, i agree with you that uh, cultural diplomacy actually brings people together and there is no relationship where you can uh, not have the people factor and the relationship is very strong. So if you see in the case of Kuwait, the whole relationship is, uh, has been built on people-to-people -people contacts. And today with such a large and vibrant Indian community, uh, it behoves on us that we organize a lot of cultural events to bring closer, not only for the Indians to make their next generation aware of what is Indian culture, but also to bring uh, Kuwaitis in the fold and uh, see a lot of wide appreciation for Indian culture uh, among the Kuwaiti people. And uh, when we organized this Festival of India, very shortly I had come in December, but we got this opportunity to organize it in March. We had got very renowned troops uh, of different genres. Uh, one was a Kavali troop for the first time, I think, in this country. Then we had this classical fusion, and we had this Rajasthani folk dance. So all these performances we staged one day in Salmiya Theatre, the other one in the Yamuk, but it was very, very widely received. 
before that just a week back uh, we had this indian business and professional council organize a concert of ustad amjad yes. ali khan i think that also we worked very closely with them and that was a huge success again so i see a lot of uh, cultural affinity cultural uh, appreciation uh, in kuwait uh, from the kuwaitis other expats as well as indians uh, for show um, i am told i was not here but uh, i think the embassy organized over 500 programs in the last two yeah, years yeah. this is an yes, astronomical astronomical yeah. number by any standards so i think uh, if you organize programs on such a large scale uh, there obviously must be a lot of uh, Uh, interest in interest it, in yeah. It, yes. well, when I first came to Kuwait, and uh, I remember the first two or three years, I uh, I don't think we went to see a film, watch a film. Mm-hmm. But uh, when I did go to watch a film, and I went to watch a Hindi film, and I was so surprised to see that most of the, you know, the members of the audience belong were Kuwaitis, and I said, how? What are they doing here? You know, I was thinking, and then uh, a friend of mine who had been here longer, and and she she said that. Well, they love Hindi films, and it's the the Arabic subtitles are there. But I think to a certain extent they even understand Hindi, you know. So, uh, so that was so they love Shah Rukh Khan and they love uh, Salman Khan and Rithik Roshan. <laughs> so yes, it is so important, and to use the soft power of uh, film and music is, um, I think, yes, it it does help. So. Uh, Education is yet another field where, uh, which I wanted to ask you about. According to Passy, the Kuwaiti population structure is mainly young people, and a certain percentage, in fact, a large percentage of students go out for higher studies. Do you see any rise in the number of Kuwaiti students opting for India? We have, we do know of Kuwaitis who have. Opt who have gone to India for uh, to study medicine, for example. We had a person on Sadaka who studied medicine in Bombay, I think uh, in uh, 1970s, and he came. And when he came back, he he rose through the ranks and became the dean of uh, you know Kuwait University right. Medical Faculty. So how how do you see this cooperation? between india and kuwait uh, do you see it going you know increasing as far as education is concerned i definitely see a very very strong uh, scope for cooperation in this area and i say this because the indian education system has also come of age today we have uh, world class institutes you name any discipline whether there is engineering in the indian institutes of technology which are now much more in number the medical colleges uh, even the humanities uh, so i think uh, the private universities that have come up in india and they are doing very very well so there is a lot of scope now for foreign students to uh, to undertake courses in india i am not sure of the numbers uh, how many people from kuwait are actually studying in india but i i not feel many, i feel that not, not too, too many. many and this is therefore this is one area where i again am very much focused on i went to the kuwait university i met them i went to the kuwait college of science and technology uh, they are uh, very very uh, i was very impressed by kuwait science uh, college of science and technology because of the state of art facilities they have and they are being run in active collaboration with iit delhi so uh, we must look at uh, opportunities of more tie ups uh, you know iit delhi is now establishing a campus in uae and tanzania so uh, this is the first time that iits are stepping out, out of the stepping. so yeah, uh, i think this is a very very good model and we should replicate in kuwait if that uh, is possible Uh, similarly on the schooling side uh, we do have a lot of indian schools 25 indian schools with uh, over 50000 students not only indians but expats as well so uh, there is a lot of scope in the education area i can tell you from my previous experience when i was looking after central asia many of the indian universities like sharda university amity university sambrum university of odisha they have established campus in uzbekistan that okay. is one country which is doing so i see so uh, i i would like to take these uh, things to our kuwaiti counterparts i think even in dubai as well if i'm not mistaken dubai has some indian universities like bits bilani and uh, or uh, right Uh, yes i think I... so because a few indian students what happens is hmm. for years and years uh indian students and which is i think a, is very difficult for indian families here that when their children hmm. come of age hmm. 
when they graduate from mm. high school mm. they are forced to send their children abroad mm. and so families get separated and i think once the family gets separated it's very difficult for mm. the family to again physically kind of relocate and stay in one place they go to mm. either go back to india or uh, to any other country and then the family is like divided mm. you know for the rest of so 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 the there has been talk of you know the universities would not only be helpful indian universities in kuwait for you know if kuwait these can also gain in admission but also for indians here who have been living here for so many years that they don't have to be separated from their children you know this is so, one thing actually when i went to the kuwait college of science and technology my first question was how many indian students yeah. and they said uh, almost none no, i think so, they are not allowed uh, no, if i'm no, not no no that mistaken. is what my impression also was yeah. and i asked them is there any restriction they said not at all in fact we give uh, scholarships okay. uh, to students who perform well and uh, they told me that yes uh, we can tell the indian community that the option of uh, taking admission in kuwait science uh, college of science and technology is very much there i am soon going to meet all the principals of indian schools and this is one message i want to convey to them okay. that this is a very very good institute it is run in collaboration with iit delhi and it is open to having indian students oh that's wonderful that's really good news sir this is this is yeah absolutely this is important information that if there is someone who is uh, and there are lots loads and loads of children mm. who are opting for science and technology mm. then there is an option available locally mm. I, i think that's very good news mm. so now uh, and this another thing i feel that maybe as far as indian schools and colleges are concerned perhaps there is a lack of information locally you know amongst the kuwaitis they don't know much about what is happening as far as education back home in india is about so maybe showcasing that may 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 help matters a bit you know they usually opt to go to either uh, the us canada europe or uk or australia but not to the in the near neighborhood let's put it that way so um, now we come to commerce which is something which trade and commerce which you are very interested in and indian kuwait have had a long history rooted in trade and commerce and this is what while i was doing sadaka this is something which i've explored again and again that how and how far this goes back we really don't know because uh, we've had archaeological remains that go back to indus valley civilization mm. in failaka and yeah. you know in other other places here which show that trade has been going on since then mm. so kuwait is india's sixth largest crude oil supplier and india is kuwait's fourth commercial partner and kuwait's sovereign wealth fund is estimated to have invested 2 billion dollars in india since 2017 taking the total investment in india to 5 billion do you see any 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 changes taking place in this there is scope for more right uh, first i would answer your question that i am focusing very much on commercial <laughs> so i take you back to my question on bangladesh days where yeah. i said that many of the things which we did actually we could see the, the uh, results result. and this is one area where actually where you see the see results it, right? and uh, and uh, to be very fair or uh, frank uh, this is a uh, trade of 12.5 billion dollars does not reflect mm-hmm. the india kuwait partnership and uh, it is to to some extent very skewed mm-hmm. 90% of it is oil supply from kuwait to india and uh, bulk of indian exports is food and related products though we have now started exporting a lot of engineering goods white goods automobiles apart from uh, organic chemicals etc but i feel that there is a lot of scope for diversification in our trade yes we need oil and kuwait is one of our trusted partners uh, long standing trusted partners for supply of oil but we need to diversify our trade particularly today when india is growing at an enormous pace there is a lot of focus on uh, different manufacturing uh, so uh, similarly uh, when you speak of investments this again uh, is a huge area of cooperation uh, the kia the kuwait investment authority has been investing all over the world and they are looking at india very positively uh, the investment seminar which we had in first week of may kia md was there there were very uh, other dignitaries and we heard even success stories of other 
Kuwaiti businesses like the Asia and the Al Ghanim who have invested in India and they are very very uh, positive about the outlook. Even KIMD mentioned that their uh, investments in India has increased considerably over the last three years. So I'm not sure the numbers you are quoting mm. are right, but right. I can say that uh, it uh, it is in double digits. Though nobody knows mm -hmm. uh, what are the actual figures, but uh, could be in double digits. And, okay, I have to and, check that. Then. And uh, and I think the future is quite good for india kuwait investment partnership do you think sir that it is uh, one of the reasons that though india is like uh, ready to export goods involving modern technology we know that there's so many changes that has taken place internally that kuwaiti buyers are perhaps still a little ignorant of india's technological progress and uh, perhaps that could be the reason could be that the indian exporters inability to advertise you know, policies and uh, or to organize sales promotion. Could it be that, that the same thing with education, mm. you know? No, you're right. This information gap everywhere yeah, is showing is gap, up, uh, right. wh whether it is commercial or education or medical uh, and healthcare. Yeah. Uh, every uh, tourism, for example, tourism, tourism, as tourism well. for example. Tourism as well. So uh, the information gap is one which actually uh, could be one of the reasons. And that is where the embassy's work is focused, uh, that how do we... Uh, bridge this information gap mm. and this investment seminar was one effort in that direction mm -hmm. so uh, this is where i think we need to work both uh, both us with the kuwaiti sides with uh, all stakeholders to bridge this information gap so that people can make informed choices mm -hmm. it's not that if i give the information a person will definitely yeah, opt the, for exactly, india yes, but if he has yes. one of the choices or options that yes this is also available in india he might go to india yeah. or he might take from india yes. so that is where our effort is uh, because other countries also have equally good opportunity they also uh, uh, develop uh, good products mm -hmm. world class products they have tourist destinations but when i have the choices uh, then i, I can, can make uh, an informed uh, yes, choice yes, yes. yes so how how is the collaboration on food security with between india and kuwait no as you rightly you yourself mentioned that india is yeah. the fourth largest uh, exporter of food products uh, to kuwait food security has been an essential component and you could see that uh, during the covid times uh, when a lot of food products were supplied from uh, india to uh, kuwait uh, you see in the supermarkets everything related from rice to spices to dairy everything is available uh, in good measure and even i think for my for our indian friends uh, there's haldiram snacks also exactly. available I think this is so one. so i so think so thankful you know that it's there a, is it's a delight yeah, to, for an indian to be uh, <laughs> to feel uh, yeah, feel in to india to feel at home you yes, know yes. yeah to feel at home and i think uh, this uh, this chain continued during covid times despite mm -hmm. the the logistical yes. nightmare yes. that we faced you know yes. despite that the chain remained unbroken yes. so which was so very important so I do yes I do want to and we mentioned we talked about this before we went in for recording about this recent uh, uh, article which I read about uh, uh, about seat sharing about about the number of uh, 12,000 seats about increasing the passengers the number of seats between India and Kuwait to about 12,000 per week for carriers of two countries because there's been such an increasing number of passengers both ways has something uh, do you see any changes coming up as far as aviation is concerned and there are certain cities which in india which continue to be uh, i won't say disconnected but there are no direct flights so you have to are you also looking into that right now uh, there is a cap of 12000 seats per side uh, weekly yeah. uh, that's working well but obviously greater and better connectivity, more connectivity is always good. I think both sides are engaged uh, in discussion on this matter. There has been a lot of transformation in India's civil aviation sector also. Uh, national airlines was privatized, then there have been certain uh, airlines which have gone out of things. So even so that uh, the number of airports have increased dramatically in uh, in india the number of aircrafts uh, air india signed one of the biggest deals in the civil aviation history that's right yeah. so there's a lot of churning going on in, I, and i think uh, we recently we had political consultation between india and kuwait and we discussed all these issues and you, will you also be looking at connecting certain cities in india which are still not which do not have direct mm -hmm. flights because uh, um, that would help a lot of people yeah mm -hmm. Mm. Oh, we hope so in future. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. So, um, I I want to ask about your Ramadan experience here. Mm. We are going, we are switching track. Mm. We are going to talk about personal experiences now. That this was your first Ramadan here in Kuwait and just happened recently. Uh, what was it like? Uh, the experience was quite different from yeah. what I had in Bangladesh. Uh, okay. Uh, how they, how was it different? In Bangladesh, we actually uh, gathered around iftar. Okay. We gathered around iftar yeah. and there were a lot of invitations and uh, uh, their hospitality focused too much on food. On food. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, could, you could relate <laughs> because you're from that part of the world. I also am domiciled yeah. in West Bengal. Yeah. So I think uh, uh, that happened around iftar. But I think there was a little different nuance here. I think in Kuwait, as far as I could understand, people... Uh, uh, iftar they do with the families and close friends, but it is actually the Divanya mm -hmm. where you go and uh, those three, four weeks, I think uh, I used to go around 8.30 in the night and come back at 12 because I think most of the Divanyas were opening yeah. around 9 to 11 and then there was a list you had to choose and sometimes you went to a wrong Divanya. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, okay. to the credit of them, they was so welcoming. Our Kuwaiti friends were so welcoming. Yeah. In fact, uh, one time I really went to uh, Divania, which I, uh, there was no wrong or yeah, right yeah. one because every Divania is open, open for everybody. everybody that's but right. actually you choose out of the 10 Divanias yeah, yeah. which ones you, yeah, want, which to one you want to go. But in the end, I, uh, I went to someone and when I met all of them, I shook hands with all of them. They could realize that I am in the wrong place and they said to me, you want to go to this one, this is there. Okay. So <laughs> okay. that is what happened. But I, I think this is a beautiful culture, uh, Divania, and uh, where I mean, actually you meet your friend, relative, anyone, anybody can come in. So there's something very, very new which I've seen. Yeah. They say that uh, uh, when I first started writing, they said that the Divania is the place, you know, it, that's the place like mm. where a lot of public opinion is formed, where public opinion changes, where political leaders can actually go and mm. if you want to reach out to your audience, it is there in the Diwania. So it it performs such an important role in Kuwait's socio-cultural uh, political life. It's a very unique kind of a institution, mm. let's put it that way. Yeah, so um, so you enjoyed it, you liked okay. it. But, yeah. uh, but uh, this part which you are telling me is more in non-Ramadan Diwaniya. That, uh, that is true. Because the Ramadan Diwaniya is, is more the, social. Yeah, Ramadan Diwaniya is no more social. pressure on time no, yeah. because there's so many people coming yeah. in to meet them. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I think we have, I do want to ask about your family. How have they kind of, uh, you know, you, your family is here in Kuwait. How have they managed to settle down here? No, I think they have managed quite well so mm -hmm. far. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, for particularly for children, I think it's uh, difficult to adapt, particularly on the schooling front. Yeah. So I would say that both the kids have done quite well on that account. And uh, it takes time for them to... Uh, but fortunately, I think things were in place. Uh, everything is available here. Uh, we came in a very good time in December. And the weather has been weather so kind good, yeah, till yeah, now, till been, now yes, I would actually. say. So I think it has been a very good uh, settling in process. So that's wonderful. So I think we've come to the end of the show. But we cannot let you go without answering our quick five section. So I'm going to ask you five fun questions and I hope you have as much fun answering them. So um, Ambassador, if I were to ask you a place in Kuwait which you like the most, what would it be? Is the, there be the beach side. The beach, the beach side? Yeah. Okay. And a Kuwaiti tradition you enjoy? I already sent Diwaniya. The Diwaniya? Yes. Okay. Your, your, now it's a personal question, your bad habit. Imp One bad habit. Impatience. 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 Okay. And um, how do you de-stress? Mm, no particular way of it, uh, but I think uh, a combination of factors, uh, spending some time with the children and okay. uh, doing walk. Uh, okay, uh, doing something physical. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And what annoys you the most? That's a difficult question. I do get annoyed when maybe things are not done on time. So okay. You're you you prefer you like punctuality. <laughs> we were punctual today. 
<laughs> not punctuality per se okay. uh, in term but punctuality yes yeah. but not uh, not that i will say you know you're okay. five minutes late yeah, yeah. but uh, if yeah, i yeah, say I that you have to There's do this job thing to be done. and uh, and i related to my earlier thing of what bad habit impatience so i will if i say please do this and then i will i know that it can be done over the day but after two hours one hour i may ask uh, have we done or yeah. so i think uh, I think that that's 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 very good. I I uh, once asked a Kuwaiti friend what is her bad habit mm. and she told me uh I'm sure you'll meet her. Mm. Uh, her name is Sundu Salhamza. Mm. She's the co-founder of Abolish 153 uh, and she said Chitali I have this very bad habit of fixing things. So if I'm visiting someone mm. I'm visiting even if I go to the minister's office mm. and the minister is talking to me and I look behind him and I see that the picture is not straight mm. I would just get up straight go to the picture fix it and come back on my seat she said that's my bad habit so it's thank you so much excellency it's it's really uh, we meet different types of people and um, it it's just a way of getting to know you know the this Kuwait is such a wonderful place so many different people from different cultures different nationalities come and live here it's a melting pot and this show allows us to get to know just a little bit of you know that melting pot thank you so much very thank much. you thank, thank you, you. Again. you are listening to the guest show on radio kuwait The show is scripted and presented by Chitali Biroy and directed by Anis Bakar. <laughs>